You are now listening to the Business Banter Podcast, where top minds in business collide and wisdom is exposed. My name is Jack Kozakowski. I'll be your host for the day. My passion for this podcast is that you walk away better personally and professionally from the amazing stories that are told. Now let's get ready to banter. So I'm super stoked today. I have an awesome guest on here who's got an insane track record of working with some of the top uh, global brands. And to just to name one is Tony Robbins. So actually, this is a really cool story, but Tyler actually was the reason that Tony Robbins built an Instagram. So he ran Tony Robbins social media for almost a year and a half, I think almost a year and a half or two years. And he can tell you a funny story. He's gonna tell you a funny story about how Tony Robbins didn't believe in Instagram when he first started working with them. He helped him build that to 1 million, 2 million followers. He also um, was running the social media, Instagram accounts, all the social media accounts for Ruka, Toy Machine. I mean, this guy has built massive million person followings on Instagram. He's got an awesome story. He's a great guy. You're going to learn, you're going to get a lot of business value out of this. He actually just um, worked for a bunch of different brands and now he's doing his own consulting. So Really interesting facts here about social media, some trends. I'm really excited to introduce you to Tyler Colbertson. So let's get ready to banter. Another episode of Business Banter Podcast. And I have like, uh, I'm like super excited for this guest today. Cause like, this is like my dude, like I love this guy. Um, and I think you, you're not gonna, you, I'm not gonna have another guest on here probably that's gonna be as like connected into being able to say that they have worked for some of the, the, the social media giants hung out with like some really cool like <laughs> athletes and i want to tell you tyler you have a blessed life so this is tyler colbert i'm just gonna introduce you um tyler kind of like introduce yourself just a bit and then you know 30 seconds or less great thanks for having me on the show today jack i really appreciate it um yeah as, as jack said i've been blessed to work with some really profound people from uh being the social media manager and podcast producer for Tony Robbins for several years to being a global social media manager for uh, the lifestyle brand Ruka that's involved in uh, surfing, skateboarding, art, jujitsu, and many other verticals. That's really exciting and having the opportunity to work with a lot of different professional athletes over the years and, and uh, be working with my passion. Jay Jay Abraham, Abraham. Yep. I've worked with uh, Joe Polish, um, David Mirren Scott, Joseph McClendon III. So yeah, it had, had been really fun working with these giants. So it's funny because I like, where did I meet you, Tyler? Like we met at a, a conference, like a gaggle lamp conference or something a while back. And um, at the time, Tyler was like literally the social media manager for Tony Robbins. So like, <laughs> I mean, like, like you were, you were like going, you were like, not necessarily like traveling around with him at, at times, but like you were, you were the guy that built his Instagram, helped him build his Instagram. I mean, at the time, like Tony Robbins, that was when he even told you, like, wasn't it like he wasn't even that sold on Instagram? <laughs> he didn't have an account. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it brought it, 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 I was mind boggling how he didn't have one, but at the time in 2015, he saw it as a platform that wasn't filled with his ideal client he associated as a a young person millennial network and at the time i believe in 2015 people ages 30 to 45 if they were online more than 35 percent of them had an ig account and once i told him that he's like uh yeah we should get on there (laughs) so so you literally took well then there was okay so you 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 worked for Tony Robbins as a social media manager, which is just a cool job in general, right? I mean, you were like at yeah, W and like, you know, you're like, it's funny cause you know, you message me and you're like behind the stage and like Tony's like doing his like, his crazy like hype warm up, And you're, you're just like, you're like in the moment with Tony Robbins in a lot of intimate, cool ways that most people didn't. You, you, I think you went to his house and was it in Fiji or did you go to his California house? Uh, Florida and uh, several times in his place in Palm Springs. And yeah, I've been blessed to spend and learn from him for several years. So, I mean, I think the cool, like my coolest, uh, the coolest takeaway from that is like all the people you get to meet along the way as well that like Tony's connected to and, you know, all those things. But before that, you know, so we'll highlight that you built Tony Robbins Instagram. I mean, you were the one that convinced him just to get on there. Um, the second thing is you built, was it, uh, what was a skateboarding brand before that, that you helped build? I created, uh, many Instagram accounts and, uh, kind of turned the lights on for their social media accounts as well in 2012 for a brand called Toy Machine Skateboards, which now they have uh, nearly 700,000 followers on Instagram. And it's 
owned and operated by a guy named Ed Templeton, who's world champion skateboarder, world renowned artist, and someone who I'd looked up to since the sixth grade. And then to fast forward in my adult career and be helping marketing his brands and running social for them was a dream come true for me. So um, I honestly equate working with Ed Templeton of Toy Machine just as special as working with Tony. So you got Toy Machine, you got Tony Robbins, and then and then you left Tony Robbins and you actually went to, uh, I mean, what is it? I, it's got to be the largest, I, is this the largest skateboarding, like apparel brand? Uh, uh, it, so yeah, it's uh, Ruka. A lot of people know it as RVCA. And I had no intentions of leaving Robbins. Um, the conversation came up that they needed someone to run social for them. And for me, my passions in life growing up have been skateboarding and art, and they have some of the world's top skateboarders, artists, and they also are heavily involved in surfing and uh, surprisingly jujitsu. And I knew the the guy, or I didn't know him yet, but I knew of him, the founder, PM Tenori, that I just really looked up to a guy like that and admired the the network and community of people he had built around his brand. And it was truly, he had built a family. And um just the the idea of being back in the mix around the best skateboarders and surfers and artists in the world really attracted me to it and i i just took a leap of faith and went after it and and joined i was really thankful i did it was um an incredible experience and got to travel to many different places with all these people and and create content with them and and host live events and just be in the mix with some really talented folks so like you know, summing that up, so toy machine, you know, helping build toy machine, Tony Robbins, Instagram, Ruka, you know, kind of taking them to the next level on, you know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, all of these people kind of the common denominator is they all kind of had a brand before you came on, but it was kind of like looking at it and going, okay, how do we scale this on a, from a social media perspective, right? Uh -huh. So between the three of those, well, we're, we're going to talk about this later, but Tyler just actually went on his own. So this is what's <laughs> interesting, right? So Tyler went from like working all these big brands and now he's taking the leap of faith. And I want to dive into that as from an entrepreneurship standpoint, because we have that in common. But first, like, you know, with the big push on social media and everybody's kind of getting it right, you work with all these brands. What's like the common denominator of the one thing that you saw that you implemented with all of these that had the biggest impact? Um, one of them, first and foremost, is a mindset to shift, to really put uh, a hat on or filter things of realizing not just you're not just a company, but you're a media outlet. Like Tony is literally a walking, breathing, living media outlet, and he had never really viewed himself that way. That he had always wanted to leverage other media outlets because he he you know he had the opportunity to be on whether it was good morning america or msnbc he had these giant conglomerates that wanted to support him but when it came to social he was way more uh impactful and powerful when leveraging his own personal social networks and same for these uh lifestyle brands and skateboarding companies that it's putting on a, a hat of that we're also a media company and that it requires creating and producing a ton of content, which, which is really cool about the skateboarding industry is they've always worn that hat for years to really have be a success and um, have a successful career in skateboarding. You had to create content, whether it was shooting photos for the magazine or filming video for uh, video parts for the world to see your talent. So I think just having that mindset and knowing that you you yourself can be a media outlet. So having the concept of Instagram is your opportunity to have your own digital magazine. YouTube is your opportunity to have your own television channel. And once you have that mindset, it, it just, you're able to see the world through a different lens and, and really go after unique opportunities. And I think a second one that was really important is is identifying um, a concept that Jay Abraham has is relational capital, and that's looking at all the points of value you have that don't necessarily require a budget or, or to spend any money. So relational capital I, um, concepts would be, for instance, for Ruka is all their pro athletes taking an aggregate of what their social reach is, what the frequency is of their posts, and how can you integrate the brand into their presence of kind of taking an influence or marketing approach, but it, taking it a lot further since they're, these are long-term sponsorships and having fun, unique ways to leverage the athletes' social profiles to drive traffic back to the brand's profiles.
Would you say like that's like the micro, I mean, just to sum that all up is micro influencers and like leveraging the people that are already your biggest fans to be your marketing mouthpiece, right? Right, exactly. I think in this day and age, um, you know, the consumer's really savvy and they know they're just kind of tuned out to marketing messaging. But when it comes from athletes they look up to or, or a, a author slash you know, famous public speaker like Tony, there's so much trust that's built within the, the moment they endorse something, they are going to be pulled further to that message. Yeah. And you're seeing that. Um, well, so I want to talk about micro influencers in a, in a little bit. I want to make sure we save time for that. But I guess my biggest takeaway from what you just said was, you know, I think Gary Vee was the one that originally kind of came up with that model, right? The media outlet, like you need to have, you know, your brand and you need to have the media side of it. Yeah. Um, skills lab is you know, the channel that we're on right now is actually that model from creation agency is the agency skills lab is the media side behind the agency right i mean this 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 is the model that we're actually following right now and it's one that i'm working on with a lot of our clients right especially in the b2b space is to say you know yes you have a brand and that's great but people don't give a shit about your brand anymore right like i mean like yeah. people are tuned out from that so how do we build a media side on this media piece that might not even be the name of your actual company right but it might bring people into the brand through the content. And I think mm -hmm. that's what you're kind of talking about. Correct. Yeah. Definitely. And so, you know, the big, the biggest thing about that is it's expensive, right? I mean, there's a, yeah, like, you have to have like pretty decent sized budget when you say to be able to actually create enough media content or, you know, enough content to create this media conglomerate piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's, you know, is there a way to hack that like for a smaller brand? Yeah, I think, you know, I, um, being that I've taken the dive or jump into doing my own thing, I myself need to do be a better job of this and, and eat my own dog food, as they say, and, and really just look at your phone as being the number one tool for you and that there's so many opportunities to just hit the ground running and, and whether it's filming that content for YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook, Instagram, um, your phone can do an incredible job and in, in achieve that outcome for you. Or if it's wanting to start a podcast, the, the audio quality on that app Anchor is really powerful and, and you can do your own show. So I think in the, the beginning for an organization, if, if budget is, uh, you know, there's limited resources, just leverage the the tools that are right in front of you and i think people are willing to see past the production value if the the content is of value to them yeah and i mean at the you know this is what what we struggle with on a daily basis is you know talking to clients and they say well we don't have content but i think like you said what i'm doing what we're doing right now like you know you can get a free zoom license <laughs> yeah you know, you can, you can go buy a, you can go to the dollar store and get a headset. I mean, you can plug yeah. it in your computer. Like there's so much way, there's so many ways to create quick, free content. Um, I do believe that, like you said, is the quality of content. I think many people still suck at that, right? They, didn't, yeah. they, they don't get the quality part, but I think there's an art to that. Um, but I think when, you know, let's tie the micro influencer piece into this. So you know, what I'm doing right now is I'm using you as a micro influencer, right? I hope you know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, granted, I know you really well. You're a good buddy of mine, but like, I can't just bring on buddies of mine or like people that I know, right? I mean, like if I'm going to have an interesting podcast, I've got to go out and look for people that have a good story that I believe are credible and that can actually, you know, have enough credibility to give, give value. Cause I think there's two, two parts to this. You when you're doing content, who can you bring on that's smarter than you, right? And that's a micro influencer. Who can you bring on that can give, tell a story, a really good story. Um, and that's essentially what you were doing with Ruka, with Tony Robbins. I mean, Tony Robbins does a lot of the micro influencer stuff, right? Um, yeah, he's, he's dabbled that. I think when he would exercise the leveraging micro influencers would be specific to a book launch per se and, and putting a team together to read the book, consume it before it launches and then have people create content in different capacities, whether you're finding that author that can write, you know, a nice blog post for you or a YouTuber to, to 
have a video review or just so someone that has a sizable audience on Instagram and is able to take a photo of them of a book, reading it by a pool or something and just say, Hey, I'm really excited to learning a ton from this new book that Tony wrote. So yeah, I think in any capacity, um, any organization can leverage in, micro influencers. And I, I, have you heard that new term that they're floating around now of nano influencers? No. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, they got all kinds of different, there's, so being even influencers now <laughs> right so it's like with for an organization that might not have a roster of sponsored athletes or these influencers they're reaching out to who within their you know their customer base or their employee base that has a following and just start from there and and, and build it out and take those steps whether they're they could be small at the time but just getting your message out and having it come from people that are coming from a space of authenticity can go a long way over time yeah, because, uh, you know, the days of just being able to kind of scream at the rooftops from your logo or your brand or even your personal brand, right? I mean, even, you know, you're seeing people get sick of just seeing you all the time, you know, whether yeah. you're, whether you're Tony, you know, Tony Robbins is a different, different kind of level, right? But like yeah. you know, somebody that's a smaller um, agency owner, like, you know, like us, you know, you're, you, you, we've only got a decent amount of, you know, a decent amount of audience. It's not that big but like at some point like people don't just want to see us get on camera and just talk all the time right i mean mm -hmm. we have to get outside and and i think where where a lot of people miss the mark is association right so there's value by association i mean if if you got on a podcast if you started your podcast which this is a brilliant idea by the way that i'm going to give you and you, and you're going to start a podcast right I mean, you've got it i i've thought about it i i think the first step i'd like to do is a youtube channel before uh, okay. Odd, but maybe so Tony be. owes you right now. I mean, like, let's talk about association value, right? I mean, if you kicked <laughs> off your first episode with, you know, I'm, I don't know if this is going to happen, but if you took, kicked it off with Tony Robbins, right? I mean, the, the value of the association in that automatically now you've got a, you know, X amount of thousands of downloads, right? Especially if Tony gives you to share. So I think, you know, but at the micro influencer level, it doesn't really matter for a lot of the brands we're working with, like they need the right people to see it. So if that means that one VP of sales that only has about, you know, 1500 connections on LinkedIn, they do a webinar with them and then they chop up that uh, content and they put it out. Um, well, you know what? He shares it. Well, 1500 of the right people are following him. Right. So I think yeah. this is where we're like, you know, where B2B brands are starting to think, I think B2C, we've, they've, they've had that figured out for a while. B2C's got budget, but it's interesting to see that from the B2B standpoint. Are you working with any B2B brands right now? Not at the moment, no. No, oh, you stick mainly to B2C? Yeah, um, I'm definitely open to it, but uh, yeah, it's just so early in the game that uh, figuring it all out, yeah. Okay, so let's go to that piece. So um, I can tell you that one of the hard, hardest decisions that I've ever made was to leave was to leave the world of comfort i would guess i would say <laughs> right working for a brand i would you know regional sales manager to act on and then all of a sudden it was like well come help me you know my business partner was like come help me open up this agency and i just kind of jumped on it and there was so much unknown you just did that right so yeah. like now you're like you're like kind of a, you're officially an entrepreneur i would say is that correct yeah i think that's for me um feels a little inflated at this point i've kind of had the real realization that at this point in the game and it's so early that it, it doesn't discourage me but i'm like well am i really an entrepreneur or just a freelancer at this point but uh it's yeah i'm, I'm just i the same thing i think you know i i left my dream job at ruka i left tony robbins to go after ruka because it literally sounded like a dream job and it was and i had the greatest time and think you know all those people I worked with are my family now and they're really close friends and it always been in the back of my mind to do my own thing and having left Tony when his network found out you know they started hitting me up they're like hey can you do for me what you did for him and you know maybe it was just on the consulting side and not necessarily on a full-time social media management basis but being in that network of people you you cannot help but think of what would it be like if i did my own agency and so i took that leap of faith like you did and yeah it's it's definitely leaving that that circle of comfort and having that guaranteed paycheck to jumping into something with a lot of uncertainty and so it's a uh, yeah, it's been really exciting. And I've had the opportunity to work with, man, almost 40 different industries now, not since I've gone on my own, but in the span of doing this. And 
Uh, so I'm just learning a lot and I look forward to continue to grow and, and wear as many different hats as I had. It's been a really cool. So what experience. are you doing now? Like what's your agency? Like what's your main area of focus? So I have two areas of focus and one is, is that day-to-day -day social media management for some people. Um, some are, I have on NDA, I can't say, and then yeah. others, um, one is a really fascinating client. They're, they're called WellPath and they're the largest provider of nurses and doctors for correctional facilities. So <laughs> super interesting. And I'm like, when I hear that, I was like, well, why would an organization like that want to be present on social media? And it turns out they have 15,000 employees. So um, just if you were to get half of those employees on following Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn, that that's a really powerful channel to communicate what's going on within the organization and, and, and adding value to their, their, their employees. So um, that's what I'm doing with them. And then the other side of the business I have is uh, just social media consulting and, and developing strategies for whether it's for professional athletes or artists that I've gotten to work with or local businesses now, um, B2C companies, things like that. Yeah, you should stick to this, the celebrity side. You know that side. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you just brought up an interesting point. So you're on your own. What, you know, how did you, what made you just take that leap of faith? Like, I mean, I know you said, like, you know, that you looked at the upside, the, but like, was it just the fact that you wanted to see what it was like to be your own boss? Like, what was a, like, what was, a, what was the main kicker? Like freedom? Like, what is it? Um, yeah, it seems like freedom on the surface and, you know, you find out a lot of other things that, you know, it's, it's just different. It, and freedom feels like that for sure of, you know, you're, you're, you're master of your own destiny. So I think first and foremost is seeing that there's a lot more potential of growth within doing your own thing, that there's different opportunities. Whereas if you're uh, working for an organization, you, especially within social media, you're only going to go so far and there's a bit of a glass ceiling there um, or ceiling to hit. So I think the opportunity of growth was my biggest determining factor of doing my own thing. Cause of, cause this, the idea of freedom is a myth. Like, <laughs> yeah. When you start your own agency, there is not like you have less freedom. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. Like, I thought that idea. Now I will say four years into it starting, I'm starting to see like a little bit of the freedom part, but like the first four years, man, it's like, you know, yeah. like there's nobody, you know, there's not, you don't have a big team. You don't have a lot of people. Um, what are you seeing? Like as starting your, for your, your own thing and getting up and running, like what's, what are the first one or two hurdles that you're like, Oh man, whew, that are like, you know, sometimes I make you rethink, did I do the right thing, right? Is there yeah. Oh, man, there's so many to list. I think <laughs> one that was the biggest adjustment for me and, um, you know, I'm at my house right now. So working out of the house that it, it can get really lonely at times. And, you know, I'm able to connect with people digitally all day long. But now I have to make a conscious effort to connect with people in real life because, the I call it a luxury now of being in an office you're surrounded by people and you get to chop it up with them and have fun and there's a community aspect there so that was a huge learning curve for me it's just this aspect of is is kind of depressing as it sounds it's it's a lonely game to some extent so that and then um just putting on the sales hat and I've you know I've sold throughout my life. I was uh, partners in a retail store many years ago. It was a skate shop in Arizona. We had a couple of locations. And so I learned selling there and it came from a place of passion. It was really easy for me to do. And so having that of being really passionate about marketing and social media and content creation, I have that passion that can come within my sales, but it's just a new muscle for me. And I haven't, you, you got to flex it every single day. And that's a really new, that's a big learning curve for me at this point. Yeah. And then what about the management piece, like time management? I mean, I know like for me, that's, that was the biggest struggle at the beginning. Yeah. There's just so many different things of creating time to do, whether it's accounting and budgeting, um, developing proposals and, and, you know, contracts, things like that. It's, you know, I've always working with in social media for almost 10 years now and seven of it being for organizations that, um, I've never had the mindset of being a nine to fiver. You just can't have that mindset with social because so much of 
your your peak times of have engagement are going to be after five o'clock at night so i don't mind the 24 7 atmosphere of work and i now being home um with my kids and my wife that there's a great balance to be had and i feel like you know that that's um a, a huge win for me and i to piggyback on your last question i think also my family um being able to see them you know it's it's been un unreal like i've so far for 2019 i've been able to prepare dinner for my family virtually every single night and yeah, that's, cool, that's yeah. a huge blessing whereas in the years past i had almost never got to make dinner for my family unless it was on the weekend so little things like that have been a huge shift for me what's your what's the social media channel right now you're the most excited for for b2b B, our b2c brands um that i'm managing yeah like what's your favorite like what what What's your favorite channel of all of them right now? Um, for the the social network itself? Yeah, just for mar social marketing, like, you know, for your clients. Oh, man. Um, well, it's been a trip to say I've been a professional Instagrammer for almost eight years now. And that's kind of like the bread and butter. And finally, I feel like every industry has adopted it. But um, one that, you know, you were so far ahead of the curve on it. And I feel like I'm seeing it pop up more and more within our space is, is LinkedIn. It's just a huge opportunity. And for me personally, if you went to my LinkedIn, I am not eating my own dog food at this point and I need to get on that train. And I think for a third thing to come back to your other question of learning is I've always been the guy behind the scenes and building other people's brands and never putting the spotlight on myself. So I've it's been a long time coming and I, it's, that's another muscle that I got to build and flex and figure out. So LinkedIn, I think there's really a ton of power there. And to give you a third one, I think that scares people away budget wise, but it's so powerful in terms of discoverability and building an audience that can be really lucrative over time would be YouTube. And if, it, if it's as simple as a blog with your phone, um, you know, I think there's a ton of opportunity within YouTube. Do you think it, do you think you could get a lot of traction on, I mean, like this is, I, I have this argument with people all the time, but like YouTube just, I feel like you have to have some type of production value to like, if, to get real value out of YouTube. I don't know. Are you familiar with Elliot Hulse? Uh -uh. So he's a, he's a, like, he, he owns some gyms and he, he's kind of in that personal development space and he, he built a massive audience on YouTube with it's just it looks like his phone like the production quality was not there years ago when he started and he just does one take and he tells a story um whatever it's related to his business or personal life and it just really resonated with people um over the years you know i would we'd make that argument um over production you know the production value and production quality is key but i think at the end of the day it's always the content that will win so if you wanted you know i think um, an example, I always tie everything back to skateboarding, but there was this per period of time when skateboarding was trans transitioning to HD video and a lot of the cinematographers weren't evolving and buying HD cameras and they'd stick to their three chip uh, Sony VX 1000s and that a lot of people are still loyal to that camera for the aesthetic and it, it doesn't look that good, but it's like, you know what, the skateboarding is incredible. It's there. So it's like, if you have a passion for storytelling, I really think your phone can, or a, or a zoom call can really come across and add a ton of value. Yeah. I'm just always curious. Cause you know, with YouTube, i like, it's just been the one, it's the one social channel that I've never been able to figure out. Like I just haven't like, uh, yeah. It's a, it's the hardest one. I mean, what are the, like if you were gonna, if you were a, a brand today, what what would you be like the first two steps? You know, say you're like you're thinking right now. You're like, I want to be on. We need to be on YouTube, right? Like everybody's yeah. telling us, we know we need the SEO value. We know that that's where a lot of eyeballs are. Like, yeah. what you know, if you're doing consulting for a brand, um, what what do you? What's the first like three steps you say before you even like put one up? Like, what do you got? What do you got to think through? I think. Um, developing a content series so something you can refer back to so even if it's as simple as like having your step and repeat background like it looks really professional and there's consistency there it's branded um, but it, it it looks nice right and so uh, developing a content series where there's consistency and messaging and then coming up with a keyword strategy of doing a simple search on Google AdWords and figuring out where are the keywords that are relevant to 
your uh, your industry in figuring out what is the what are the search terms that people are looking for. You know, uh, many of you know listening to this, but it's always great to reiterate and and hear that you know YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, owned by the largest search engine in the world. So the 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 idea um, for the the opportunity for discoverability is huge, and um, trying to think of a third step that you would go after. I think commitment and and budget. You know, <laughs> budget. Yeah, budget. I think it goes back to the phone too. Of yeah, you you know it, if you know it's editing or even a graphic designer to create your YouTube thumbnails. Of there's different things involved, but um, it, it'd be committing to it and having consistency for at least give it 12 months and, and see where it goes because you know you're not going to become a youtube superstar within a couple of months it, it's possible but uh, if you're a b2b company i think just that commitment and then look at if if even if your channel doesn't blow up look at all the opportunities you have to communicate around that video um, with your clients or internally with your organization that it, it gives you more things to talk about. It was funny. I just thought of a story last night. My one of my best friends were in the sauna and he's a, a, a medical sales rep. And he's like, dude, I, all I do is talk to people all day long. It's like, I'm talking to my team and then I'm talking to the receptionist at the doctor's office. Then I talk to the doctor and a lot of these people I've seen for years, it's like, I've run out of things to talk. What do I talk to them about? You know, <laughs> yeah. keep, but it's yeah. like, what if you started a vlog and you had the opportunity to talk about your new video? You know, there's, it's just another way to generate a meaningful conversation that can add people value to people's lives and get beyond the surface things of talking about the weather or how your weekend was. Well, I think from an SEO standpoint, like you're going to like, especially if you're a bigger brand right now, like if you don't get a YouTube strategy, you're going to die. Like it's going to, you're going to fizzle yeah. out from a youth. The other thing is that, and I know, you know, I'm like you said, I'm I need, I need to start eating my, eat my own dog food, which, you know, hopefully this podcast will be my first set of YouTube series. Right. But uh, when I think about YouTube too, is the, is the ad value, like the ad space is super cheap and you can get a yeah. lot of, you know, you can get a lot of attention. Now, can you get a lot of like totally. conversions? No, but I think from a brand awareness perspective, like it's a mm -hmm. no brainer right now. Totally. Yeah. It's, um, surprised to see how many brands aren't on YouTube and, Oh, uh, let me add one more thing in, in terms of a step for if you were to get onto YouTube is a huge mistake that brands make. And even YouTube creators is they, they treat it, which is the right way to treat it is a TV channel, right? You're, you're publishing your video content, but the piece they miss is, uh, is identifying with your YouTube channel is it's just as important social network as your Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. And all those social functions are built within the platform of liking and commenting. And I've seen over the past when you treat your YouTube channel like the other social networks and reply back to fans and communicate with them, it just, it compounds tenfold. And, and the, that YouTube community loves when you treat that native network as its own social network and not just kind of publish video and leave it be like, be active within that network and reply back to every single comment because it pays dividends. Well, that's the thing is YouTube, you know, David, that's why I think people, especially like if you've got kids and you're like, what the hell are my kids watching right now? Like, you know, like yeah. that's where the kids are, man. I might, I mean, you, you, oh, it's like, nuts. my nieces come over and like they're 13, 14 and, and eight. And I'm like, I can't get up to watch. They don't watch TV anymore. Right. They're like, yeah. they're like, they watch it. They're like religiously watching the weirdest, stuff but like that's their new tv i mean plain 100 yeah and that's that's i think why if you got to commit to youtube or why it's like a safe bet is i don't you know who's gonna upend youtube right now like facebook's going hard at it but it's like so ingrained and in, i have a three-year-old who asked for youtube you know it's like it's gonna be here for so long that it's like you gotta stake your claim at some level and build a presence and you know listen to me, I'm, I'm giving the advice and I've never done that. And I'll be fully transparent, but I've, this is something that I've, I've built for brands over the years, you know, managing Tony's YouTube or Ruka's or toy machines and many other brands like foundation skateboards and others that, you know, it's, it's relevant, whether you're a personal brand or uh, an organization, I think just having a presence and building out a channel that even building out a channel, there's opportunities to have those SEO um, signals going where you're linking your website to your YouTube channel. And there's just a lot of op 
optimization to be had on the back end there. Well, and also it's like, if you're going to be selling to Gen Z, maybe you don't sell to Gen Z right now. Maybe your brand's like, um, you know, um, more like, let's just say older millennials, like early baby boomers, whatever that, whatever the generational gap is. But like, if you plan to sell to Gen Z in the next 10 years, you got to start now. So maybe yeah. like, it's not, maybe it's not actually about like, well, we, our audience lives there right now. It's like, when we're talking to brands, it's like, well, you better build now because it's a tough place to build to figure out, to do enough stuff to figure out what works and what doesn't so that at that point, you actually have the audience, you know, there. Because I'll tell you, it's a scary thing watching my nieces on their iPads and I'm looking and going, oh God, I feel sorry for any brand that's not, th that's not going to be on YouTube in front of them if they're trying to sell to them because that's where they live. Like yeah. <laughs> a, TV ad, a TV ad ain't going to do it, man. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Well, this is, yeah. So we're about, we got about three minutes left. Um, I want to know, so let's, I want to know one cool story. So I want to know one of your favorite uh, Tony Robbins stories where you worked with him kind of behind the scenes and on his crew. Oh man. Um, well, to, to back it up, it's, it's a funny story. We alluded to it with the Instagram thing of telling that, but I'll, I'll add more context to it. So within the Robbins organization, they, they'd have two executive meetings a year, one that's in July, that's in San Diego where their headquarters. And then in January, they go to his home in Florida. And my very first day at work was the July executive meeting in San Diego. And they normally Skype in, Tony Skypes in and the whole team's there. And, and what the, the, what that meeting looks like, it's basically the, you get the chairman's update, chairman's state of the union of what Tony's been up to the past six months. And then they review um, the goals they had set for January and where they're at and how they're going to finish the year. Um, so really excited for my first day at work there. And so they, they're Skyping in Tony and there's some IT issues as usual. And we're like, oh, and I'm just kind of like, oh man, I wonder if this is going to set off. And then all of a sudden, Tony kicks the door open. He was actually there the whole time and he joins the meeting in person and surprised all of us. And we're just, you know, everyone's lit up and the guy sits down right next to me. And I'm like, I can't believe my first day at work. I'm sitting next to Tony Robbins and he's telling us about his involvement with virtual reality. Um, it was the first time I ever put virtual reality goggles on. It was 2015. It was like, I was on the, the court side at a golden state warriors game. And he's telling us all these involvements he has with, uh, he was becoming partners in LAFC, which is the LA's new soccer team and all these rad updates. And I was just like, this guy's incredible. Everyone knows he's incredible, but hearing firsthand of everything he's involved in was really nuts. And, so we we broke for our meeting about three hours into it and had a little lunch break and I was like I gotta go up and introduce myself to this guy like I'd always forget if I didn't so I went up and said hey howdy Tony my name's Tyler I'm your new social media manager he's oh great like how long have you been here I was like uh, I've been here about three hours today it's my first day and so I started laughing and that's when I asked him. I was like hey man I I noticed you're not on Instagram like what's up with that and he's like oh this that's not my ideal client isn't on there I was I told him those stats of 30 to 45 year olds that almost 40% of uh, that age group was on there and it turned his head. And what's funny is within a couple months, we launched his Instagram. He had an account. He had his handle at Tony Robbins. Um, there was 25,000 followers on there with zero content. And uh, within months we had it going and it scaled, you know, to 2 million followers within like a year and a half or two. Um, and the, the neat thing was, is that he became obsessed with Instagram. Like it became his most important social network. And he, he just loved it so much and he wanted to be involved as busy as that guy was. It was always awesome to see his enthusiasm for social media. And he knew how important it was and that for it to succeed, that he had to dedicate time to it. So that was a, you know, a huge factor or blessing for me to be able to work with them in that capacity so i always love that story that's cool i mean that's something you'll never forget like you'll know, you know and that's kind of like one of those like you're sitting at the dinner table with, like all your friends and like oh you guys want to hear a cool story i mean like that, <laughs> that like that story never gets old and there's nobody that's ever going to say oh that's one boring story <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, and then I was say real quick that I believe he is one of the greatest storytellers of all time. And if you have the opportunity to go to one of his events, I highly encourage you to do so not only for the experience, but just to see that man go 16 hours on stage and deliver how he does is unreal. No one does it like him. And he's, 
one of the funniest, best storytellers of all time. I love it, dude. Well, you're, uh, so I don't know if we talked about this, but you're like uh, hours away, maybe a day away from having another kid. So probably yeah. have to let you go. So how do people uh, reach out to you, Tyler? So um, my favorite social network to be on personally is Instagram. So you can find me at Tyler Colbertson um, or connect with me on LinkedIn, or you can take a look at my website at tylercolbertson.com. You got to follow Tyler just for his Insta stories. Like they're, 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 I, all my Insta stories, I like watch what he does. And then I ping him and say, Hey man, how did you do that? What, what, what tool did you use? So just, you know, just for the, the simple value of, if you want to see somebody that's mastered Instagram stories, follow Tyler. All right, Tyler, thanks for your time. And uh, see you guys all next week. Thanks, Jack.